Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to continue right where we last left off, um, looking at the uh, the Scandinavians during the Viking Age. In our last lecture, we uh, we concluded our examination of Charlemagne and the Carolingian dynasty, the Carolingian Empire. We saw the Carolingian Empire morph into the Holy Roman Empire with the elevation of Charlemagne to the um, imperial office. We also saw, um, we also discussed uh, during the end of our lecture on uh, on the Carolingians that that the elevation to the office of Holy Roman Emperor created more problems for the Carolingians than in actually solving them or adding prestige to them. Uh, the title will become a prestigious title in Western and Central Europe, but for the Carolingians, it sort of weakened them. Uh, Charlemagne went from being the arbiter of papal matters to a servant of the Pope because he received the imperial title from the Pope. He, had, he attempted to arrest that by crowning his son and heir, Louis the Pious, as emperor. But two years after uh, Charlemagne's death, Louis had to, uh, had to go to Rome and be uh, crowned and publicly acknowledged by the Pope um, as Holy Roman Emperor. And that would uh, have very drastic, dynastic implications on the Carolingians, and it would also have drastic and dynastic implications for subsequent dynasties that followed the, the Carolingians. All right, um, and we, we began our look at the uh, at the Norsemen. We looked at the Vikings. We looked at who they were. They were Scandinavians. Uh, they were Jutes. They were Danes. They were Swedes. They were Norsemen. Um, they, they were people living at the very north of Europe. Um, they they formed the linchpin uh, in the great trade route known as the Northern Arc. Um, and uh, and that they were still pagans. They worshipped God, uh, the old Germanic gods of Woden or Odin, Thor, uh, Tyr, and of course Frigga. Now, while we have very good archaeological records for Scandinavia, um, written records are severely lacking from this period. We know very little about pre-Christian Scandinavia, and, and and Scandinavia does not take hold. Uh, of Christianity, it, it does not. It does not become dominant there until after 1000. Now the Scandinavians, they left behind uh, a little bit of written records of their own. Uh, we do have runes uh, that that is the old Germanic uh, writings that are carved into stones. Um, these writings, uh, as we discussed, went back to the Roman era. They were influenced by the Latin alphabet and the runes of Scandinavia. Are, are are really curt and they're not very descriptive. Um, they 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 state facts like Thorvald's lake, uh, telling us that someone named Thorvald owned the lake, but not informing us um, how Thorvald came into possession of this lake, um, who Thorvald was, or or, uh, or or why they're recording that this is Thorvald's lake. Um, the lengthier runes are equally frustrating because they can be quite exotic, uh, stating um, desper a, a desperate situation in a faraway land, but not identifying who wrote it, when it was written, or what the situation was like in the land that they're writing about. Um, uh, the, they, the lengthy poems, the sagas, and the chronicles that were, li that were written down um, they, they were written down in the Christian era and they were based on the old oral traditions of the Scandinavians. Now while we always, um, we always caution against the use of oral traditions, they can be of great use and generally speaking they should not be dismissed out of hand. Um, a case in point would be the Scandinavian Vinland Saga uh, and these are prime examples of this. The Vinland Saga tells the stories of the Vinlanders. Uh, it also tells the story of Eric the Red, the Saga of Eric the Red. And these sagas were written down in the 13th century. The Vinlander, the Vinlander Saga tells the story of a group of Scandinavians who traveled west of Greenland and they established a settlement in an area they called Vinland, uh, where they lived for some time. Now, the saga tells 
uh, even tells us of the Scandinavians who went there. Uh, we know Leif Erikson was among the, the Scandinavians who went to, to Vinland. Uh, now, most scholars scoffed at the idea that Scandinavians had traveled west to Greenland and that they had encountered land. Uh, that, that is until 1961 when the Scandinavian uh, settlement um, what was, uh, what was discovered at Leyan O Meadows um, in, in Newfoundland. Um, the settlement showed that there had been a, a very sizable Scandinavian settlement there and that Scandinavians had lived there for a few generations. Now, the discovery vindicated the Vinlander saga to an extent. Uh, and, 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 uh, and later authors of the 13th century were also vindicated because they wrote of uh, the Vinlander saga and they wrote of the exploits of the men who went there. Now, while archaeological evidence can vindicate the, the presence of Scandinavians in Vinland, we are still at a loss as to what they actually did there or what their interaction with the native peoples were like. Um, because our sources are so limited and under descriptive of Scandinavia uh, in the 8th and the 9th centuries, many theories abound as to how and why the Scandinavians turned from trading to raiding. Uh, and, and then settling in the 10th century. Many uh, uh, of the theories, and, and really let me go back by saying among the theories are overpopulation. Uh, overpopulation resulting in migrations in many different directions. And this is possible, but again, cannot be disproven or proven uh, using written records or, or, any, other, um, or any other benchmark. Uh, now, another theory involves discord in Scandinavia, as increasing uh, royal centralization was occurring. Um, as increasing royal centralization was occurring, many of the defeated former petty kings or aristocratic families, they were forced to flee. They had to leave along with their retainers to new lands. Um, and now another theory suggests that disruptions with their trade partners in the Eastern Mediterranean due to wars in the Islamic world, resulted in an economic depression uh, and the Scandinavians um, ultimately decided to turn to plundering their neighbors. Um, now, another theory suggests that the Scandinavians faced severe problems regarding access to arable land. Um, there, there simply was not enough arable land to go around and that the Scandinavians uh, retained contact with the Jewish king, uh, Ken, and uh, the British Isles and the, 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 the kin there, the, the British Jutes, um, regaled them with tales of Britain's agricultural capabilities and wealth. Um, regaled them with the tales of wealth of Francia, uh, of the agricultural capabilities of, of, uh, of Ireland. Um, all of these bear a bit of truth. All of these theories bear a bit of truth. Had the Viking assaults settlements and trade building uh, and, and trade empire building must be seen as a wider network of Scandinavian expansion across many different regions. Um, the Scandinavian traveled to Newfoundland, Greenland, um, and they remained there until the 15th century. They go to Iceland where they are actually the first people to inhabit Iceland. Um, the Icelandic language is actually just Old Norse, unchanged since the first Scandinavians arrived. Um, the Viking attacks were not limited to the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms or the Carolingian Empire. The Vikings attacked Islamic Al-Andalus. In the 840s and the 850s, they, they traveled to the Mediterranean. Uh, they raided the wealthy Islamic port cities. Um, the Vikings even attacked Constantinople in 860. Um, they don't take the city. No one ever, uh, no one takes Constantinople easily. Um, but they do attack it. Uh, the Scandinavians, in addition to settling Iceland and Greenland, they migrated east and they settled in the East Baltic as far south as Ukraine and, and into Russia. And they laid the foundations of Kievan Rus uh, in the 8th and the 9th centuries. As a matter of fact, the name Rus uh, first applied to the Swedes who settled in Russia uh, and as a matter of fact, the first great ruling dynasty in Russia, the Rurikids, they're descended from a Viking raider, Rurik. Um, 
Rory Kid is a Greek trend. It's a Greek drum uh, rendition of it. Aid is of descent, and then Rurik is the man. Um, they're descended from the Viking ra raider Rurik, uh, and Rurik, um, Rurik, uh, and, and the Rurik dynasty in a way would would survive until the 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 uh, the twentieth twentieth um, century. Um, Ivan the Terrible was a Rurik kid, um, czar. And when the Rurikid dynasty died out, um, there was a uh, a family that that had married into the ruling dynasty, a, a Russian noble family, uh, the Romanovs. Uh, the Romanovs, one of the Romanov members, Anastasia Romanov, she had married Ivan the Terrible, really Ivan the Dreaded. It's a very bad translation for uh, for a Russian title, for a Russian uh, nickname. Um, he. Be because he had married one of them, they were in the contention for the running of uh, 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 of the nomination to be uh, the new czar. And uh, Czar Michael the First was a uh, a relative of hers, and he was largely elected due to uh, due to that association with Ivan the Dreaded, um, due due to that imperial association. But the Rurikids, uh, the first great dynasty in Russia, um, they're descendants of a Viking of a Viking. Um, the Rus would intermarry with the local Slavic populations, and this admixture would give rise to the Russian population. So these these uh, these Swedes who move in and they settle into uh, what is now the Ukraine and what is now Russia, uh, they they move in, they intermarry with the Slavic population, and they give rise to the Russian population of Eastern Europe. Now the Christians were very much taken aback by the ferocity and the savagery of the Viking raids. Along with the names of the Vikings themselves, um, and, and, and Viking world leaders that they bore these very uh, eye-popping names, names like Eric Bloodaxe, Thorfinn Skull Splitter, uh, and, and these names give very nice indications of their careers uh, and, and their skill sets. Uh, we we know that Eric fought with an axe, and that he was very good at killing people um, with his axe. Hence, his axe is always bloody. Uh, we know that Thorfinn was adept at splitting the skulls of his enemies. Um, a little, uh, a little fact on that: Thorfinn Skull Splitter, uh, his descendants live in the uh, uh, live in the uh, the Orkney Islands, and they produce uh, a local ale, Skull Splitter Ale, and it has a nice alcoholic content. So if you get nice and drunk off of it. You will be feeling uh, like like your skull is splitting um, due to the hangover. Now the Viking raids, uh, the Viking raids begin with the attack on the British Isles in the 1780s. Um, but but they're very low scale, they're very low intensity until 793, in which a devastating raid is carried out on the monastery of Lindisfarne. Now, the survivors uh, of Lindisfarne, they widely publicize what happened to them. They make sure that everybody knows what happened to them, what happened to their monastery. Um, the larger Christian community is made aware of what happened. Uh, the larger uh, attacks soon follow on other parts of the British Isle. Um, and, and, they, and quickly, attacks are made on Ireland. Uh, Ireland is first raided in 795. The monastery that uh, at, at Aona, the monastery founded by St. Columba, is raided in 795 as well. It's raided again in 802, 806, and 807, at which point the monks get the message and they abandon the monastery. Uh, the first Viking attacks on the Carolingian Empire comes in 799. Uh, again, this attack was directed towards a monastery off the coast at Nour Mortier. Um, for the Carolingians, the raids were little more than a seasonal nuisance between 800 and 840. Uh, once in a blue moon, the Vikings would target a monastery or a coastal town. Uh, these raids were not a threat to the Carolingians overall. During the 840s, the, Carol the Viking attacks, um, they began to change somewhat. Uh, they began to change somewhat dramatically. They become more frequent and more intense. Uh, the size and the duration of the Viking assaults changed as well. In 834, the port city of Dorsted um, 
or, or Dorstad, um, better, uh, better pronunciation for it, Dorstad was attacked by a large Viking war band. This war band comes back in uh, the next year, the next uh, two years, in 835 and 836 to raid Dorstad. Between uh, 841 and 892, raids occur, uh, occur on a yearly basis. Uh, they mainly uh, target wealthy, um, undefended monasteries, um, and, and that's because they offered up gold and silver plate, as well as no opposition to the Viking uh, attacks. Um, the Vikings also attacked anything and anywhere that they caught that, that caught their fancy. Um, all of the leading towns and cities of the Carolingian Empire are sacked at least uh, at least once during the 800s. Uh, the Viking raids, um, uh, the Viking raiders were looking for loot and plunder um, that, that that they could then easily travel uh, travel back to Scandinavia. Would they? They also came looking for slaves. Uh, I want to. Um, I also uh, I also want to draw. Uh, a, a conclusion with that. Um, the Scandinavians um, were, were slaveholders. Uh, they, they held slaves in Scandinavia, but they also traded slaves with Constantinople and Baghdad. Um, they, they were slave traders as well, so they're raiding uh, for plunder, they're raiding for people to take back to Scandinavia as slaves, uh, and they're also looking for people to trade as slaves with uh, Constantinople and Baghdad. Has the had the Vikings uh, uh, raids became more and more intense and more and more regular, they began to drift deeper and deeper into the Carolingian Empire. They're no longer just attacking coastal or fringe uh, population centers. Um, uh, the Vikings, uh, the Vikings began to exploit the river networks of Europe. Uh, they're also able to sail as far up the rivers as they want allowing uh, raiding parties to drift deep and deep inland, disembark from their boats, and plunder the countryside. Um, now afterwards, the raiding party simply departed for home, uh, often not encountering con uh, Carolingian resistance due to the swiftness of their assault and the reluctance of the Carolingian to pursue them. Now this creates a general panic in the Carolingian Empire because now anywhere, anyone can be attacked at any time. Now, the great misconception uh, about Scandinavians of the Viking Age regards their nature. As stated earlier, not all Scandinavians at this time were Vikings. Most were farmers and tradesmen. Even the Vikings, uh, even the Vikings who, uh, who took to the sea, uh, even those who took to the sea and became seaborne raiders, they were still farmers who raided to supplement their income or their material holdings. A typical Viking raider year would follow this uh, pattern. First, a farmer would plant his crops early in the spring. Then he would join a war band leaving for Northern Francia or Eastern Britain. Uh, they would raid during the warm summer months. Uh, they would then leave behind a few men for defenses um, and, and, and slaves at, at home. They would leave a few men at home to, uh, for defenses and they would leave their slaves uh, to work their fields. And in the fall, when it was time to harvest the crops, they would stop raiding and they would return home to Scandinavia where they would bring in their crops and spend the winter months drinking uh, and, in, and in, the, uh, in the following spring, they would simply repeat this pattern once again. Now this seasonal pattern provided a brief respite for the, for the neighboring peoples who were, the, who were subject to the Viking attacks, to the seaborne raids. This changed, this seasonal pattern changed in the 840s with the raids occurring yearly in regions far inland um, and, and, and with the practice of wintering. Now wintering involved the members of a raiding party staying behind in Francia or Britain um, through the winter, uh, normally on an island off the coast or in a river. Um, in order to get a head start on next spring's raids. Uh, and this was first done in Ireland in the 830s. Wintering in Ireland led to the founding actually of Dublin, which was, a, which was um, as I stated earlier, which began its life as a Viking settlement. 
Um, the, the wintering practice then spread to the Carolingian Empire in the 840s. Now, the typical winter camp was located near water and at a distance from the local population. As the 9th century went on, um, wintering became a permanent feature of the Viking raids. Now, Charles Martel, Pepin the Short, and Charlemagne, they were all accustomed to accepting tribute from their neighbors. Um, accepting tribute is a sign that a, uh, a nation, a power, um, uh, a, a state, uh, that, that they have the strength and dominance to impose such uh, to impose such compulsory actions by their neighbors. Um, it, it's a sign that your neighbors acknowledge that you are the strongest and the most dominant power in, in, in your local region. By 820, that was a regular feature of the Carolingian Empire. Uh, the Carolingians started paying tribute to the Vikings, um, and, and that was an ill omen, and it was deeply embarrassing to the heirs of Charlemagne. Um, in 845, a fleet of Viking warships were spotted sailing up the Seine River towards Paris. Um, the Carolingian king, Charles the Bald, he decided that it was simply not worth fighting the raiders. He decided to buy off the raiders. Charles the Bald paid the Vikings 7,000 pounds of silver to turn around and leave. And this payment initiated a trend of offering money in exchange for security. Uh, the payment to Vikings became known as the Donegeld, uh, the money paid to the Danes. Now, between 850 and 890, the rulers of West Francia made 10 large Donegeld payments to the Vikings, uh, to Vikings threatening their domains. Now, the, the payment of such large amounts of silver to the Vikings led to a large reduction in silver in circulation in the Carolingian Empire. The Donegal payments were often the results of negotiations between warband leaders and Frankish officials, which were very favorable to the Vikings. Uh, the payments only brought the only bought the protection of a particular region, leaving other portions of the Carolingian Empire open to attack. Um, there were stipulations regarding how long the there were no stipulations, I should say, regarding how long of a period of peace the payment bought, um, and, and and that allowed and that allowed the Viking to show up in a few months requesting another payment. The Carolingian rulers were not in a strong enough position by by this point to refuse the Vikings uh, anything. They, they could not um, refuse Viking threats. The Viking raids, wintering, uh, and ability to drift deep within the Carolingian Empire was possible due to their longship. The Viking longship was crafted to travel through the different regions of Scandinavia. Um, water routes were chosen because Scandinavia was still very heavily forested. Um, all of the major settlements were coastal. The interior of Scandinavia is very rugged and mountainous. Um, so, so you're not getting a lot of uh, overland routes in Scandinavia. It is far easier, far more convenient to simply use water routes or, or sea routes. Um, now, the shoreline of Scandinavia is home to many fjords and channels. Uh, and, and to, uh, to ease movement of trading goods and improve communication, the longboat was developed by the Scandinavians uh, because, again, the, the land is mountainous, it's rugged, it's broken up by dense tangles of, of cold, uh, cold jungles. Um, it, it's simply easier to simply trade uh, and communicate by, by sea routes. Um, the longboat was capable of carrying some 50 to 100 people. Um, it was about 60 feet long, was capable of sailing in open water, and only drew somewhere around 3 to 4 feet of water. Now, uh, this made travel up rivers very easy. The versatility of the longboat with the, uh, with the crucial technological advantage that allowed the Vikings to raid and threaten so many places. Um, you could never really get a hang on them because their boat was just the technological marvel that gave them many, many options. Now, the Carolingians 
tried to counter the Viking raid by building fortified bridges. Uh, they did this along the Seine, and this and this strategy largely failed as a deterrent because the Vikings would simply get out of their boats uh, and drag them around the bridges. Uh, a, a skill picked up during their, during their days trading in the Northern Ark, uh, trading along the Northern Trade Route. Um, had the major Russian rivers do not all um, do not at all um, interact or, or align or, or intersect, it was necessary to drag the trade boats over land, or, or over land. And the success of the Viking raids illustrate to, uh, to all how weak the Carolingians had become. Um, Islamic al Dalus began to make incursions. Um, and in 846, the city of Rome is attacked. Uh, and the defenders hunker down behind their walls, so so the attackers do not really gain access to the city. But the Basilica of St. Peter, which at that point laid outside the city walls of Rome, is attacked. Um, Islamic uh, attackers attack the, the Basilica of St. Peter. In 890, a group of Arab raiders established a base uh, at a mountain near the Alps. Um, for the next 80 years, travelers were routinely harassed, robbed, and held for ransom had they tried to, uh, to cross the Alps. The Magyars, a new group of people in Europe uh, coming in from Central Asia, uh, they attacked the Carolinian borders in the east. Uh, the Magyars were like the Huns, and from around the year 900, they continually raid the borderlands uh, and the countryside of the Carolingian Empire. The weakness of the Carolingians allowed the Magyars to penetrate deeper into Francia and actually sack Pavia or, or Pavia, the old Lombard capital. Um, the the Magyars would also go on and uh, would go on and penetrate West Francia. Now the attacks from the north, the east, and the west were too much for the Carolingians to bear, and they would uh, begin to lose control over all of their dominions. Now, the Viking raids began to die down in the 10th century. Uh, by the mid-10th century, the raids were over on the continent. Um, the end of the Viking attacks are as much a mystery as their beginnings. The... Now, um, the, the, the position that we have is that we're not all entirely clear why the attacks ended. Uh, and again, just like how there are a number of theories for why the attacks begin, there are a number of theories for why the attacks ended. One is that there simply was nothing left of value to take in Francia. Two, the Viking raids gave Scandinavia remarkable amounts of material wealth in the form of gold and silver. Uh, third, that the Viking attacks on the settlement, uh, the Viking attacks and then later Viking settlements in the British Isles, and this would include places like Edinburgh, Dublin, York, um, the settlement in Iceland and Vinland, gave the uh, the Vikings more success and reoriented their their uh, their focus from trading uh, and agriculture away from raiding. Fourth, the Carolingians finally focused their resources on tempering Vikings ambitions. After the failure of the Danegel payments, after the failure of the fortified bridges, Scandinavians throughout the Viking world um, were, were brought in um, uh, to settle along key uh, Frankish um, territory, key Frankish zones that were, that were uh, th easily threatened by the Vikings. Uh, and, and these, of course, would be the great mouths of the great rivers of the Frankish Empire. Um, the Scandinavians themselves, with the exception of the British Isles, they do not settle in large numbers on the continent. There are two really, um, two really key exceptions. Um, the Rus, who settle along the Baltic and into Eastern Europe, and in Normandy in northern France uh, or northern Francia. In 911, the king of West Francia, Charles the Simple, he defeated a Viking warband led by a Norseman named Rolf. Um, Rolf and, and, uh, was approached by Charles the Simple, who decided to take the Viking into his employ and make him a count, a, a, a high-ranking official with political 
administrative and military responsibilities. In exchange, Rolf had to convert to Christianity and defend Western Francia from future Viking or Scandinavian or Norseman attacks. Um, in the process, he changed his name to Rollo or Robert, um, and, and he began to protect the mouth of the Seine River, the aquatic gateway to Paris. Now, the land given to Rollo became known as Northmania, uh, the land of the Northmen or Norsemen, and we know it better as Normandy. Now, in Normandy, Rolf, Rollo, slash Robert, and his descendants will go on to play a major role in deterring raids on, on Western Francia. But the damage had already been done by the Viking raids to, to the Carolingian dynasty. Uh, it was a mortal wound to the authority and the position and the prestige of the Carolingian dynast. Um, and, and that will conclude, this, this concludes our, uh, our discussion on, uh, on the Viking Age. Um, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about it. Let me know, let me know what you thought about our entire lecture block dealing with Europe, Persia, and, uh, and Islam. Um, our next lecture block is going to detail Africa, um, where we're, we're going to be um, initiate a period in which we're going to ping pong between Africa, uh, Eastern Asia, and uh, the Americas. We're going to uh, first begin in Africa, we're going to go to Eastern Asia, and then we're going to go to the Americas. Um, sort of a deviation from the uh, standard world history course. Uh, this course was designed for some homeschool groups that I work with. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the, the future lectures, but they are uh, very much different and they, and they do stand, uh, have them markedly different from what um, typically would be given in a world history course, even at the collegiate level. Um, in, a, in a typical world history course, you would not deviate from the course of events that we've discussed heading into the direction of, uh, of the development of Western Europe. Uh, you would not go in and, and examine any of the other cultures that we're going to examine, but um, I'm, I'm going to take out there. We are, we are going to on this, uh, on, and in this course, and in, in, in this discourse, we are going to examine those cultures, those events, those states. We're, we're going to tell those stories. Um, I, hope you guys, I hope you guys enjoy them, and I will see you guys next time for another lecture.